Environmental Conservation Committee on January 7th. And if we can make sure we have a good roll call. So I'm just gonna go along the line. I see Michelle Martinelli, Kevin Walsh, Dart Strayer, Dennis Brennan, Janet Wynn. And then in the room, we have Supervisor Puccini, Puccioni, uh, Matt Yeddo, um, Seth Goldstein, Elena Finnan, um, myself and Clark, and then Chairman Delarada. Very well. Thank you. And is there anybody from the public, any emails or anybody online that wishes to speak? Um, there's no one online and I didn't receive any emails. Very well. That brings us to the minutes of December 3rd, 2021. If everybody has had an opportunity to review those, uh, I will make a motion to accept. I'll second that. And any opposed? And that will carry unanimously. And Ms. Robertson, that would bring us to our COVID-19 updates. Okay, great, thank you. Um, we actually are still very healthy and happy up in the, I don't wanna jinx us, <laughs> building and planning department, but right now we have um, nobody out for COVID and we're just maintaining our uh, protocols. The, the safety glass between us and the public, I think works pretty well. And um, I think, as far as I can tell, we're pretty happy with with the COVID protocols that we have in place right now. I did it. I did get um, a question from a board member if we were going to go all virtual. I don't have plans to go all virtual unless somebody tells me otherwise. I think the hybrid still works really good, and then it's your, your comfort level on what you want to do there. I agree. I don't think we need to go all virtual. The hybrid seems to work well. I've had a couple of meetings where I was the only person in the room, but that's still fine. <laughs> so, okay. So I have a bunch of resolutions for the beginning of the year. Um, you guys probably saw I put in the packet, the town of Niskuna was able to get the Climate Smart Communities Grant. That's awesome. And it's critical to us becoming a Climate Smart community. Like the Climate Smart Task Force has been working on their items for about a year and a half and kind of hit a wall to where what needs to be done now has to use a consultant. So it covers, the grant covers three main things that are pretty important. It's greenhouse gas inventories for the town and the community, and then um, a government climate action plan. So um, we would need a resolution accepting the grant. And I know, I know Janet, this has been a while because it was a while ago when we submitted it and I can't remember if we identified where the match was going to come from or if we need to do that now because we actually got it. But I think that we decided that we're going to make sure that we outline the match up front and where it's coming from. So I should put all that in the resolution for the end of the month. Yeah, that'll have to be a discussion with uh, the supervisor. And um, another discussion, which we can have, you know, here or there before finance is that um, the EV charging stations, we remembered to budget for the software, but we didn't remember to budget for the energy. Like we would, we, which we didn't think about until they were talking about putting the meters up for all the stations. So each EV charging station will have its own national grid meter. Um, we talked about putting that meter with the charging station uh, software so that we have one kind of budget section where we can see what they cost. Um, if we want to offset those costs or not, so we can have that discussion and then potentially a budget mod for finance on those one. I think it's yeah, so. You know, you know, if you get get us some figures um, to myself and the supervisor, and I'll put a placeholder on finance. Yeah. You know, for the budget mod, but we don't. We won't necessarily have everything together for uh, on the budget mods for finance, but we'll put a placeholder there with a figure. Yeah. Thanks, Janet. Um, okay, a slightly easier one is the 1930 Hillside Ave. There's a church there that I think used to have a daycare. When when um, daycares move in and out of churches, it requires a special use permit, um, which is a, a lengthy process. I mean, 
it would be the same process for getting a gas station that we have for child care is going into churches. Um, so um, I try to move those along. They're not changing anything around the building. They're not, um, you know, sometimes they add a playground to the church, but we make sure that there's, you know, adequate room for pickup and drop off at the planning board. But generally speaking, um, it's such a lengthy process that I try to get that out and ahead so that it doesn't have to take four to five months for these things to happen. Um, so I just have a tentative potential resolution for the end of the month, which would be calling for a public hearing. Um, I don't know if that's doable or not, but I'm putting it out there. It'll depend on what happens at the planning board meeting on Monday. All right. Very well. And just to go back to A, that's a great job on that Climate Smart Communities grant uh, to yourself and our comptroller's office. Um, how much is that total now? Do you know that we've gotten in Climate Smart Community grants? It's, 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 let's see, for Climate Smart specific, we got, including the EV charges and the charging stations, you're probably in the range of like 150, maybe a little bit less. Um, but another cool thing about this grant is we got that $100,000 for those four high impact action items. You remember every month we were reporting on the four impact the impact action items, which is like, you know, the energy code and all adopting the solar um, standard solar application and things like that. I mean, NYSERDA and DEC rolled out another program very similar. So this grant allows us to become climate smart certified, which gives us points towards another $75,000. So we're trying to go for that. We got the $5,000 for adopting the energy code. Um, we can talk about that more at the climate smart. We can get $5,000 for doing that solarized Albany campaign. So, but this, this would be a pretty big uh, help and lift to get us that 75. So then we'd be up in the range of like 250, um, you know, thousand. And most of that is very little match. This happens to be a 50, 50 match, but a lot of them are zero match. Yes. Which is great. It's a great program. Um, it allows us to actually get money for saving money. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's awesome. Yeah. And then you just keep reinvesting in the green infrastructure that saves you money. Like we did all the led right. lights at town hall and the payback cycle on that, I think was two years. Absolutely. So we're already saving money on those. Thank you, Laura. Mm -hmm. Um, so D is board reappointments. We have the 2022 appointments are, um, committees like complete streets and conservation advisory council. They're one year terms. Um, so those guys all have to get reappointed. I reached out to pretty much all of them. They seem happy to continue. Um, so I just, you know, as you, I standard procedure is to put all the names forward who have been performing and helping. Um, and uh, so Elena has the list of all their names, which I can send you guys if you want, but it's just reappointments. And then I broke out. We do have a planning board member that, um, had to step aside because of work conflicts, Mo Oster. So our normal process would be to rotate in the um, alternate because they've been through all the meetings and they know all the projects. So I reached out to Daisy. She's willing to rotate in. That would be my recommendation for who we put on the planning board. But I figured we should separate that one out and talk about it here. And we can put that one on at the end of the month. Yeah, she sounds like a great pick. Uh, any thoughts, Kevin? Uh, both alternates are more than capable, so I, you know that's basically a town board decision. And I'm I'm double checking, but I believe Daisy was first appointed, so I, I typically go with the the one that. All right. Yeah. Very well. Excellent. Um, then um, my intern reappointments. I think we're putting on the organizational meeting as well um, and backdating them so that they could work because of course the interns can only work on the weeks <laughs> that they don't have school or college. So I've had uh, Zach and Shivani up helping us. They're both great. I've had them for multiple years now and I'm very happy to have them come back. I don't have to train them. They just come in and do work and then leave. So I appreciate their reappointments. I have the budget for them. Oh, their, their salaries? Okay. Um, and then the last resolution I could think of was we typically in January do a resolution setting the 2022 TDE rates at the end of the month. Um, I I know there's a little bit of a question because we've had some, 
some, so, so we had an engineer go to one of our TDEs and then we've had an engineer come from one of our TDEs. And so there was a question on, um, you know, who we wanted to be on this list. I do know that in discussions with our engineer that went to the TDE, that I think it's because he has a professional stamp. He's not allowed to work directly with us for a period of time, like a cooling off period. Um, so I don't think that they have any benefit from um, having him go over there. Um, but we can talk about that later. I'm not... I'm not set on any of the list of people on this list. We usually reach out to about 12 firms and um, and then we just kind of distribute the workload through them. So um, I can give you guys the list and I can, you know, double check into what that, you know, cooling off period was if we have a concern there. And then uh, we can have them on for the end of the month if that seems okay. Did you want to add anything to that? Does that sound okay, Janet? Yes, thank you, Laura. Yep. Okay. And then it, um, I can bring it up on the um, the calendar. I know we um, we wanted to wait for um, Supervisor Puccioni to come to take a look at the dates for the Economic Development Committee meeting. So I have on the calendar in your packet, which I can bring up if you guys want to see the the dates. I, it's showing the first Friday of every month at 8.30 a.m. Um, I don't know if that is okay for people or if we want to change it. What are we thinking about it? It works for you? Yeah, so we so can, yeah, that'll work for, for the... Okay. Excellent. Thanks, Laura. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, um, the first Friday is sometimes flexible. Like, if you look at, like, July, our Friday, I think, is separated out from probably the rest of the committees because the first Friday comes uh, actually like a week and a day before. So some of that's a little flexible, but as long as like the Friday 8.30 time works and it seems to work. So that's good. Okay. So I'll leave it as is unless you guys send me an email. Um, just quick uh, follow-up discussions of the land donation at 540 Gasner Ave that was on the agenda for, um, you know, December. And it's my understanding that Paul Briggs was able to get that signed. I know my staff saw him in the office at the very end of the year last year because the landowner wanted to close in 2021. So I do believe that that was accomplished. Um, and thankful for that because that's like we talked about some pretty, some pretty good habitat and um, sort of starts to piece together, um, you know, the Woodlawn Nature Preserve with the Stanford Forest with the Albany Pine Bush. So Happy about that. And then um, at our last meeting, we had talked to, talked about adopting the New York State stretch code. It did get approved by New York State. We can do that. My plan is to do an email blast and try and reach out to the contractors. Um, I wanted to do it on January 1st, but just ran out of time. So maybe shooting towards February 1st, give people two or three weeks notice, and then the, um, the higher standards will go into effect. Um, I know that I think holidays kind of like, you know, slow all this stuff down. We talked about, at the last meeting about <laughs> adopting the code of conduct. I imagine that we, um, I know Clark had some fantastic comments I had sent to the comptroller's office and they were working through them. Um, we can touch base when we have a moment to breathe and then get back to it. But I do really think that's important and I want to make sure that it doesn't get lost. I agree. Um. I've had a couple members of the, um, the you know the 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 CCA like capital region type of you know volunteer committee still asking if we wanted to do a letter kind of rejecting the mega offer instead of accepting it. <laughs> I can show you guys that rejection letter. I'm not 100% sure it's necessary. I'm still listening and paying attention, um, but the CCA again, is still on pause a little bit until they work out who the administrator is. Thank you. And then um, the, tw the 2023 NISC Unit Comprehensive Plan, we said we'd start getting to work on that in January. Um, and we will. <laughs> I just um, think that it's the most important thing that our department could be doing right now. It's, it's just going to be a tough um it's going to be tough for us. We're maxed out now, and that's a lot of work. Like I've been talking to the um, 
you know, the, I've been talking to Kevin, to Dart, some people who have been on the comprehensive plan committee. And like to Dart's point, like when you're on that committee, it's so much work. Like you almost have to remove yourself from the other committees. I mean, you can't carry them all. Um, so maybe just uh, we'll just have to work on balancing things and take a look at that. But I know that that needs to start happening. So I've got that on there. And then this was just a reminder. We had also talked about the dumpster enclosure codes in December. I, I pulled out that code again, um, and I can show it to you, Elena. It may <laughs> it may make sense. I, I couldn't really believe at Matt's meeting and Ray's meeting that we don't have a that we don't have a code prohibiting dumping. And I read read every section of code that I could think of while we were in that meeting, and we don't. So if we're looking at dumping and transfer station, then let's look at the dumpster enclosures. Mr. Strayer, start on the line. Yes, I am. Um, the 2023 comprehensive plan. I know that a, I know the last one that was done was very comprehensive, of course, and very thorough. Um, in light of that, is the is this comprehensive plan? Do you think will take less time or as much time as the previous one? Um, I don't know. I think what. You know, when the town decides um, like what they want to accomplish and what the goals of the next plan will be, then we can sort of sort it out. Um, for the 20, um, for the previous plan, we deliberately decided to start from scratch. So we spent, you know, some time working on like where, where the town should go. We sent a survey out to the residents each of the town met each of the board members on the comprehensive plan went out and examined um, a part of the town and came back and reported what they saw. So we spent um, a fair amount of time up front um, sort of defining and understanding what the town needs were. Um, if you wanted to just do a um, in addition to the existing town plan, and let's say fill in some of the gaps that we found, because there's certainly gaps in the comprehensive plan and things have changed. I mean, you gotta remember that a comprehensive plan is just a snapshot at a given time. I, I think that would go a lot faster. It really depends on you know what the town wants to do with this. You know, maybe um, having some discussions up front with some of the committees might might help facilitate that. Just if we could identify where we think you know, the plan should go or um, where the committees have seen holes or something. I don't know, Laura, we, we haven't really discussed it. Yeah, I just, there's a couple of things I noticed um, in doing the Climate Smart certification. One of the main items is your comprehensive plan. So if you, if we go through that, incorporate the Climate Smart, like Climate Smart goals in our comprehensive plan, that's very important to our Climate Smart certification. And the other thing that I think is missing from our comprehensive plan, which I really want to work with the uh, racial equity task force on is, um, you know, just an equity component um, and equity goals. And um, I mean, there is a transportation section that the complete streets was trying to rework so that it would be more, you know, pedestrian and bicycle and alternative transportation equality friendly. <laughs> um, but there are yeah, like things that have evolved in the last 10 years, but the two big ones that I do want to work on making sure that our plan has incorporated this go round are that, that, that it's, I mean, planning has noticed it as well. So making sure that your planning is, is equitable and then um, doing the, the climate smart stuff too, just makes sense. So we kind of need a plan for the plan. Sounds like, yeah. right? Which and I think is fairly normal, yeah, actually. <laughs> I agree. I agree. And I don't, um, I don't know. Perhaps, Laura, if if that's something that you and Dart can do without a whole lot of time, and then the board can take a look at it and and kind of put it on the list of priorities. Yeah, like an like an implementation plan. I think we may, um, and maybe even some type of hybrid, Dart, between what you did. Uh, 10 years ago and you know what we're going to do now I don't know I guess but after you yeah, I, I would suggest that um, we get maybe a couple more people than just Laura and I um, doing that I don't know I don't want to put Kevin on the spot but <laughs> he's smiling um, 
Yeah, I think what we need to do is identify some personnel that have the time to support, you know, get a yeah. brainstorming session together. Um, uh, we, we can talk about it at the planning board meeting to see, you know, who from the planning board would like to uh, uh, be uh, on, on the team this time. I think Dave Diarpino and I believe Mo Oster were the representatives last mm -hmm. time. So yeah, I think I think we got to start with that, and then if we just generate a list of all the things that we've run into, like Laura just mentioned, a couple items, just start a list because um, I think we might be able to get away with just an update, Dart, like you're saying, uh, make it um, a little bit quicker, especially with the workload that the planning department has. Yeah, yeah no, I I agree with you, Kevin. One thing I think that we did last time, um, which I thought was good, was list the accomplishments from the previous um, comprehensive plan in the plan itself i think it's good because it really shows the town progress that's not a, actually a big um part of the plan but yeah i agree with you kevin yep in our historic uh, uh preservation section you know we got to see if we can tighten that up obviously based mm -hmm. on uh, some of the things that we ran into the past year yeah and i would think the natural resource inventory we probably want to talk a little bit about yep i think we definitely want to expand that section as well. All right, very well. It sounds like we can get that ball moving a little bit more downhill. Yeah, yep, it's Thanks. January, yep. <laughs> so I will. Um, the I know Seth has a couple times done an email blast for me on the vacancies to our advisory boards. We did have Nick Bonanno um, from the CAC step down. He had some family. Um, conflicts. So we have three vacancies on the CAC, which is pretty high. And the CAC is, um, a, you know, a pretty legally important board. So that's going to be the number one priority, I think, for filling in 2022. Um, the other boards, I think they do generally okay. I mean, your tree council is nine people and they have one vacancy. I Complete streets is nine people and they have one vacancy. Still love to have those vacancy filled, but the CAC is the top priority. So if you guys know, you know, well, maybe we can do an email blast, um, get some get some interest again. I was planning on doing it mid-month. Mid-month? Because I was waiting till after the org meeting, so we knew exactly. Who we we're asking for, yes, that makes right, sense. Because we're going to be for the uh, places where we need employees also. So. Yeah, and those have worked really well. I think every time Seth has done an email blast, I've gotten at least one or two people for the board, so that's nice. Um, I like that. Yes, that would be great. And hopefully we got some a lot of new members on the board. So our new members hopefully can reach out to uh, people, people that, that they know and volunteers and get some people on these boards. It is a great way to uh, for the community to be involved in policy making. So yeah, we do need to fill those up. Thank you, Laura. Mm -hmm. Um so planning board, Kevin can jump in. I'm gonna put the the townhomes, because this is kind of the biggest thing that we're working through in the with planning review right now, is the townhomes between CVS and WRGB. Um, they had some pretty lengthy discussion both at the Conservation Advisory Council and at the planning, oops, and at the planning board um, in December. That's the daycare. Um, so, and one of the big things was they were proposing twenty units. Um, the Conservation Advisory Council, and I think with the Planning Board support, really wanted to make this project more closely adhere to the average density development, and 20 units was just a little too high, so they convinced the developer to take a unit off. So this is the new configuration that the developers are wanting to take before the Zoning Board. I know we talked at the last meeting that when this goes to the Zoning Board, you know, people get a mail out. So there's a potential that there'll be outreach with questions and things. It gets re-noticed because they took buildings off. So the variances are different. So they will be mailing to all the surrounding residents again. Um, they shifted the stormwater a little bit and they added some more open space because they lost a building. So the, the main configuration is the same. The number of buildings is less with corresponding um, open, you know, open space a little bit more. You know, I think the CAC still thinks that there's some work that could be done. Um, there always is. The planning board can continue to review it and do their recommendation to the zoning board this upcoming Monday. Um, so if you guys have any questions about that, um, let me know. That's the big one. And then uh, 
3,800 State Street. That's um, uh, uh, Sukhdev Singh. He's got a business. S&G. Is that yeah, S&G? S&G, yes. He's got a business just a little bit farther down Route 5, and um, he's scheduled to go before the planning board for a tenant change. I think he's just moving to a bigger building. So it's an existing Niski unit business moving a little bit down State Street. Um, and then the other thing we have on planning board for Monday is the Capital District Jewish Holocaust Memorial Time Extension. We talked about that at the last meeting. I don't think that there was too many concerns at the last planning board meeting, Kevin. So uh, we have that on for approval on Monday. No, I think everybody supports uh, and understands the situation and they just need more time. That's all. Yep. Um, so zoning board has three cases. The one case from um, Baltown Road rolled over into January um, the, for the grants update. I just, I had two questions. They don't have to be answered at this month. This is kind of my running list of things we need to do, but we have the Union Street crosswalk, which could be ready to go back out to bid if we wanted to put that one back out to bid. Um, I would love to just meet with the finance department and see where we are in reimbursement and if we're ready to move forward with putting that one out to bid. Same is true with the critical pedestrian grants, the crosswalk for St. Joseph's and um, and the sidewalk on Knott Street. Both those things are getting pretty close. So maybe just as a, you know, something to think about, you know, meeting in the, in the, in the coming months if we want to put those out to bid and get working on them in the spring, this is a good time to put things out to bid. How is the broken in coming? <laughs> I took them off the agenda because for like three months I'm saying they're going to be open soon. But I think this is, it's, I think this is it. I actually think they'll open this month. Um, the planning, the building inspector did a walkthrough like a couple days ago, right, Claire? Yeah. Mm. And, um, He's just, he's building anticipation and suspense yes. is what he's doing. <laughs> Can't wait. Yep. I think he's as close as he has ever been. So we're, we're hoping, I think, for January 15th. Um, and then the other thing that kind of ties in, I believe that the town board did um, put the Plum Street sidewalk in their budget for this year, which I'm very thankful for. And I know the Complete Streets was very excited about. Um, this is the time of year for us to put it out. So um, I just thought that could be a priority from Complete Streets to see if we could get the Plum Street sidewalk rolling because I believe we have the set aside. So um, the Tree Council, I wanted to thank the highway for helping with the 2022-2021 tree order. We got a bunch of um, really good diverse trees, which will make Niskayuna better. Um, we did submit the tree certification for uh, Tree City on the very last day of 2021. And um, this is something um, that Linda and I stumbled across when we were looking at, uh, I can't actually even remember what we were looking at, but there's a Girl Scout Tree Promise grant. And it has, it's a, it's a thing that where the Girl Scouts work with municipalities and the Girl Scouts plant a lot of trees and do uh, outreach to the community. And um, my, like my staff person, Linda Shaketti, is also heavily involved in Girl Scouts and has put together a good plan that she would like to present to the um, town board to see if the town would want to support um, the, this Girl Scout Tree Promise Grant. So she can do a presentation at the um, maybe the next town board meeting if you guys are interested in listening to it. It's a very, it looks like a very fun and cool program. That should work. Okay. I will let her know. Um, and then I don't, I didn't see Roy on the phone today, but Roy Thornton came to the Conservation Advisory Council um, Wednesday night. And then I know he was at the Highway and Engineering Committee meeting yesterday morning. And he just was very thankful of the way that the um, Blatnick Park had been mowed last year. It supported a lot of wild birds. And so he wanted to see if we could continue those types of mowing. And he was supportive of the low mow initiative that the Conservation Advisory Council has been working on. I don't know if you wanted to add on to that, Dart. Like, I think generally speaking, CAC is very supportive of his goals as well. <laughs> yeah, no, it was a good discussion. And what was really interesting was this summer we had a consultant 
come and walk through the Blatnick Park area that wasn't really mowed that much um, above the former dump. And we saw an awful lot of birds. It's very interesting when you walk through with a naturalist and really that area is quite diverse. Um, so I think it's a real asset. And um, I think it was a really serendipitous um, event that happened last year where it wasn't mowed as frequently. Yeah. yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I know it's complicated for the highway department. Um, and so like we like to try and find a way where we can balance, you know, what they need with what the birds need. But it did work last year. And so we're really hopeful that there's a way to make it work this year, too. Um, and then I think we're just waiting on me to proceed with the NRI. Um, but we got the contract to where we want it. And we already received the reimbursement for it. So we just need to get going on the NRI. That's very exciting. Ashok does that all himself as long as he's got all the paperwork in hand. So, um, so we'll be working on that in 2022 as well. Um, we pretty much touched on the Climate Smart Communities Task Force the, with the grants and the things that they're working on. Um, and then for the Architectural Review Board, did you want to jump in for that one? Yeah, okay. We're trying to move it along. <laughs> They're working on the Shannon Boulevard homes, um, finalizing the Eastern Parkway mixed-use building, and um, they had worked with Joel on a couple farm um, homes for Kelts Farm, so hopefully we get some resubmittals on that. Um, and um, building department, as usual, has been extremely busy this last December. Um, they've been working with Knott's Landing West, for a temporary certificate of occupancy request. Rivers Ledge has also requested a temporary certificate of occupancy. So some of those buildings are getting very close to being um, ready, um, but there's some legal issues on both, which are taking up a lot of time. <laughs> and I was thankful to Paul Briggs for helping me and Elena's already stepped in and is, is, is grabbing the reins on them. So we'll be working with both properties today, to, well, probably, Maybe not tomorrow, hopefully not tomorrow, but to get these things closed out within the next um, couple of days. And then we weren't able to get the zombie home registration out in 2021. So it's so close. Me and Linda will try and get that out uh, very early this month and get those zombie homes on the registration list. Um, for the planning department, you know, I promise you I won't take the console road sidewalk off. <laughs> but uh, there hasn't been any movement on that that I know of. Um, we've been working pretty hard on the Van Antwerp Hilltop water line. Final subdivision approval. Luigi dropped off the subdivision plats, Matt. Um, I need to ask you, Elena, though, there's a note on there that is probably wrong. I guess we just have to double check and decide if it's worth making them print the things out or if it's something that we can deal with. Um, so I'll just show that to you guys quickly, and then we can decide if Matt can sign it or not. And then... Um, like Clark and I had a really good pre-construction meeting with Mohawk Golf Club. Um, they want to build their, they want to actually start building their um, maintenance building, you know, within the next week or two while the earth can still be moved and start chipping away at the demo, de demolition and stuff of the old buildings. So Matt and uh, Dan identified a couple of things that they, they need to get back to us. Um, Ken also identified a snow loading question. So they're going to be working on those things, but, you may see some movement on their um, maintenance building this spring. And then the Eastern Parkway, I think, is finishing up their engineering review. Um, not ready for building permit yet, but getting close. And then I just had a couple legal things, um, which I can go over with Elena. When we were working on the COs and stuff for Knott's Landing and River's Ledge, it reminded me that we still don't have the final docs for the Harmon Grove subdivision. So, um, their attorney has been working on that for us. Hopefully we'll get that soon and then we can close out the roads and utilities um, on that subdivision. And then we have some pending building department court cases, which we have to figure out where they stand and try and move them forward. That was all I had, unless you had something that you want to add. Okay. And then Dennis, I'll turn it over to you, but I did want to mention that I know we were kind of waiting on some legal guidance for the historic code, but there's been a lot of interest in a couple historic buildings along Route 7, and the interest in some cases has been demolition. <laughs> so I would really like to ele elevate this. I will elevate it myself 
to try and get that historical code update going um, so that we at least have some mechanism for, um, you know, discouraging these things that create our community and are some, in some cases, the fabric of our community from just being able to be taken down without a thought. doesn't mean they can't take them down, but it, allow, it requires that they pause and that they work with us um, so that we can make sure that if needed, they can be protected and restored. You are on mute. <laughs> you have to unmute yourself, Dennis. We're primarily waiting for some legal advice. Yes, we were. Legal wording. So we'll ho hopefully could be able to move that along. Yeah. Um, um, just a couple of other things I'd like to mention. First of all, uh, I noticed you have the Grange on there, the historic Grange. Uh, unfortunately, Matt Wall is going to have to step aside from it. Uh, that project. So we're we're sort of back to square one again. I'm not sure how we're going to get that off the ground, but uh, hopefully we can find some way of doing something to uh, restore that building. Uh, and then one other quick thing, we did get a grant for a new historic marker for the Winnie home on uh, Rosendale Road. Um, marker will be, uh, well, it's already been ordered and we'll be able to put it up. It'll go on the, uh, beside the Mohawk bike path. Uh, in front of the home. The home is uh, just east of the railroad station. And actually the front of the home faces the railroad station. Um, so at any rate, we'll have a, a second historic marker we can put up. That's it. That's very exciting. Thanks, Dennis. Mm -hmm. I think the more of those we can get, the better, because that also just kind of marks and reminds people of our history and creates a sense of place. I'm very supportive of them. And I like to see them in communities. Like I even like when I'm driving to Clifton Park, you know, along 146, there's a couple of those historic markers on those homes yeah. that are right along 146. But I feel like it adds interest to where you're going and you're like, wow, that's cool. So I think that's a big benefit to getting those signs up in town of Niskuna. I agree. We can never forget our history. No question. <laughs> Can't argue with you there. Hold on. Oh, well, I'll ask. Dennis, do you know, did we have to do a resolution to accept the grant for the um, for the sign? Uh, I don't know. Um, I think there was one for the last sign we got. I'll have but, to, I think there was, uh, too. I'll look for that one. Check with the controller's office. Maybe they, because um, I did, I did, uh, we got the check. I gave it to Janet, so. Okay, if there's a check and bow, then we should be doing it. Yeah, it may have a threshold that's, we'll have to check. Um, oh, and I did want to mention, you did send me the names of the people that need reappointment on the historic committee, so I sent those to right. Lena, so that shouldn't be a problem, I don't think. Yep, good, thank you. Um, did anybody else have anything? All right, is there anything else for the good of the order? I'd like to give you guys some good news. While I'm sitting here, I just received a, email from Frank that one of the DASNY grant checks for $250,000 will be processed on the 14th. That must be the River Road, is my guess. Yeah, it doesn't have, it just has a project number on it and I'm not in the office to see that. That's very um, exciting. Thanks, Janet. That is excellent. Thank you very much. Janet, can you repeat that? There'll be a check coming in from, um, it says Town of Niskayuna Sam Grant Project 15978. Right. And the uh, check will process on January 14th for $250,000. So we'll probably have it, you know, seven to, seven to 10 days after that. Excellent. Well, happy new year. <laughs> we spent it. <laughs> but it's and Dennis, that it's coming back in. <laughs> I do have the um, uh, Pomeroy check is on budget mod. So you're all set with that. It's already been deposited. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Wonderful. Is there anything else? Seeing none, I'll make a motion to adjourn. I gladly second. Are there any opposed? And we are adjourned. Happy New Year once again, all. Yep. Happy New Year and thank you, everybody. Thanks, guys. Thanks. <laughs>